gorgeous. Hi, hi, hi. Oh, it's so nice to see you all. Did you have a nice night last night? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, all right, well, I hope you had some coffee. I hope you're ready to talk about culturally confronting loneliness. And I promise you that this is gonna be a fun hour, even though it's a very serious topic. Um, it really is nice to see you all. I thank you, first of all, for taking time in your schedule and prioritizing this conversation. I am so thrilled to be on stage with Justin McLeod. Um, I wanna just say, I wanna tell a little story about what's brought us to this moment. Great. So Justin and I met, um, we met for the first time seven years ago in a completely inauspicious panel. Like, it was a brunch day, we were, I, we were passing, <laughs> I was published, I was working on a book, he was launching, um, like building Hinge, and we were in this some um, kind of dingy um, corporate, you don't even remember, but anyway, I, I'll tell you why, <laughs> I'll tell you why this matters, because I remember. So Justin told a story that morning about the founding of Hinge, um, and said lovely things about his wife, which I always think is a good quality in a human being when you say nice things about your partner. And I remembered this moment. And so seven years later, when I heard that Justin was launching a new initiative, which we're gonna talk about today, to, to address the loneliness crisis, it was a spark, it was a remembrance. And so when I talk about life being long and the connections that you make along the way, this is one of those moments that set the stage for us to be here today. So I just wanna say how thrilled I am to be in this conversation with you. Thank you, I'm really excited to be here with you. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me set the stage for everyone about what we are even doing here and why this matters. So last year, the US Surgeon General released a report about the loneliness epidemic that we are facing in America. And he said that loneliness was a crisis on par with the opioid crisis. Let that sink in for a second, that loneliness is as damaging to our health, to our mental health, to our financial health as opioid addiction. And so this to me, this this moment, this light bulb went off for me about all the ways that we are lonely in our lives and how important it is to create community. My entire career has been about this drive to help women step into their power and create community and to be supported. And so I felt a real responsibility to use my power and privilege in this moment. Um, and so I'm really grateful for you all to be here. Justin, talk about, talk about what brings you to this moment. Great, thank you. Um, so loneliness is, uh, when I got to the core of it, and, and we were doing some work over the past couple of years at Hinge, thinking about how we can start giving back and, uh, as an organization and think about our social impact strategy. And it was really important uh, for me to start dialing in and think about like why I really started Hinge in the first place. Like what, like what was my real deep underlying why about why I started this company? And it was to solve my uh, personal problem of loneliness. And I, I, I think I, I grew up in, in a number of ways that was like, my childhood was great and I grew up in a lot of great ways and also I think I was deeply, deeply lonely as a kid, but I wouldn't have described it as that. Um, I don't, we, it, I think individualism and achievement are so baked into our culture that we don't even register connection and belonging as like an important barometer. And so I grew up as a very uh, anxious and uh, restless and achievement oriented person and trying to solve this like itch that I had. And I, and I looked everywhere. I tried drugs and alcohol to numb it. I tried becoming popular. I tried finding the perfect partner. I tried um, uh, yoga and meditation and trying to become enlightened. I tried professional success and starting a company. And none of these things were really solving this like deep, restless itch need that I had. And, uh, and through the process of building Hinge, and we went 
through a couple iterations on Hinge. Uh, but I, I really tapped into and understood the deeper problem of actually like connectedness and loneliness and belonging. And that is very, very core now, I think, to how I think about what Hinge's mission is and what I think about my own personal mission in this world is to help address loneliness. It's so refreshing that you can be so vulnerable about your own, um, like a human need, right? This idea of like connection and community is just a basic human need. One of the things that my hero, Dr. Vivek, oh, sorry, that my hero, Dr. Vivek Murthy, um, our US Surgeon General, I'm like his number one fan. Um, one of the things that he talks about is that loneliness is a signal that you need connection in the same way that hunger is a signal that you need to eat. Yes, and loneliness, you know, they say that when you're feeling lonely, it lights up the same part of your brain as when you're actually in physical pain. It's like that core to us and, and who we are. And there are you know, infants, young infants, if they are not, even if they are fed, but if they are not uh, touched, if they are not interacted with and played with, they can literally die. They call it wasting away disease. And they, they discovered this, especially in the, um, was we like institutionalized orphanages and things in the 19th century. But they literally, literally little babies will die if they are not uh, interacted with on that human level. And we carry that. And it is a, it is a foundational human need like, like water and food and shelter. What was the moment that you realized it was loneliness for you? That it wasn't some, uh, something else, that it wasn't anxiety, that it wasn't depression, that it was actually this human need for loneliness? I think it was, uh, it's really been emerging over the last four or five years as I really learned what it meant to uh, connect more deeply uh, with my partner, to connect more deeply with my community at work. Uh, it's a whole, it's a skill set that frankly we're not really taught as, as uh, children and we're not really, uh, it's not prioritized, is how do you create deep connection and belonging? How do you deeply reveal yourself and how do you deeply see into others? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was thinking about my journey to come to this moment of loneliness. And for me, I, I mean, I appreciate so much that you recognized this at an early age, but I didn't even see it in my own life until two years ago when I first heard Dr. Murthy talk about the loneliness epidemic. I was like, I'm not lonely. <laughs> I was like, I run a community of amazing people. We talk to each other all the time. We're in conversation. We're talking about really vulnerable things. And I was like, am I? I was like, what? And I, I realized in looking back, I came up, you talked about this drive for success. So I came up in my career of this era of like never let them see you sweat. Mm. I used to call it the Ann Choquette show. I would walk into a meeting and I would be like, everything's great, how's it going? Nothing, you don't, no, no problems here, no vulnerabilities, nothing, I don't need help. No, I got it. You talked about, right, the rugged individualism. Um, that was me, that was my corporate rise. But when I realized, when I had this like epiphany moment about loneliness, I looked back at some of those, what I thought was stress. When I became editor in chief of Seventeen, I was the youngest editor in chief at the time. I was single. Um, I was suddenly separated from my team that had helped me rise. I had a whole new team to, um, to sort of figure out how we were gonna support each other. And I was so depleted at the end of the week that I would just sit on my couch and the tears would come because I just was, I didn't know what else to do. I didn't have the support system around me. And when I looked back through this lens of loneliness, I realized that's what it was. I thought it was stress and overwhelm, but it was lack of support and isolation. And I built the team I built the support system I need, but it wasn't immediate. I didn't have it there already to turn it on. And so for me to look at these, it happened again when I became um, an entrepreneur, right? When I acquired the list and stepped into this role as a, as a solopreneur, <laughs> that I was, I 
Um, I found myself unsupported and isolated and lonely. Um, I actually, there was an amazing coach who's a member of the list who said to me, who's in your boat? And I thought that was a really great question. Okay, I was like, well, there's no, I was like, I don't know who's in my boat. She says, is your husband in your boat? I was like, yes, my husband is in my boat. I was like, there's a couple of boats rowing alongside, but at least we're rowing in the right direction. So all of this was like, okay, get more people in your boat. How do you build the connections around you? So that for me was, um, that was my realization of how loneliness played in my life. And it wasn't, and I think that a lot of people, I think there's a lot of people here who would say, I'm not lonely. Like yeah. I don't, even, even all the people out there who didn't come into this room probably looked at culturally confronting loneliness and they were like, yep. who's lonely? Like there's something wrong with you if you're lonely. I think you tapped into something really important there that we are, I really believe that as, as humans, our, we're social animals, our brains are social organs. And it's really important to, we, we essentially co-regulate our emotions with other people. So it's, it's really hard to, I mean, you can learn to regulate emotions by, by yourself, but it is much, much, much easier when you can share and diffuse your stress or your sadness and form connections with others. And when you say people in your boat, I also, I mean, I, I'm, I'm surrounded by people. I've always been surrounded by people. I, it was very important to me early on to be really popular and in the center, but you can be lonely in a crowd. You can be lonely in a, in a large group of people. And it's ultimately when you are feeling truly stressed or broken or you think something's wrong, who do you actually go to and who can you sort of like let your guard down in front of and reveal yourself fully where you are and who feels comfortable doing that for you so that you can hold space for them. And I think if we're honest, a lot of people would say there's almost maybe no one, maybe even we're in a relation, like a romantic relationship with a partner with someone we've been married to for 10 or 20 years. I know plenty of these couples that cannot still reveal themselves to one another mm. in those kinds of, even with that amount of familiarity and that, you know, you're, you're together that much. Uh, so that I think is the, it's like how do you pull more people into the boat of being able to really do that. You know, when I came to your office and we were prepping for this conversation, I was so impressed about the way you talked about building your team. Will you talk a little bit about how you create connections on your team and what you do, what you feel like your responsibility is in that way? Yeah, so we have a few key principles at, at Hinge about how we run our organization. And one of those is tend to trust. And by tend, I mean cultivate. How do, we, how do you cultivate trust uh, as a key foundational, like one of four major principles in our company? And what that really means is that we, we prioritize relationality, that we would prioritize that you actually build the relationship first and establish trust before you try to start getting work done together. Because if you don't do that, it's very hard. You spend a lot of your time and your brain on the politics and on your projections and everything else. So, uh, I set this with the, with the executive team at Hinge. So at Hinge, we have executive team meetings every two weeks, and they're two hours long. And the way that we start an executive team meeting, first we have an hour-long breakfast before where we're just supposed to be, we, we don't really talk about work. And then we come in, and, and for the first 30 minutes of a two-hour executive team meeting, so 25% of our time, we do these things called temperature checks, where you share a gratitude and an anxiety and a hope. And those can be professional, those can be personal. Uh, certainly, as a team, over time, those have gotten uh, more and more uh, intimate and more and more revealing and more and more vulnerable as we've built trust in that, in that group. And what it's done is create a very um, cohesive, high-trust environment where we prioritize, where we can get work done better, but we also are really prioritizing that relationality because how often do you come into a meeting and you've got something really big on your mind? I don't know, maybe a, a relative is um, really sick or uh, you've got some big thing happening with your family tomorrow or you're worried about your kid or whatever. And, and if, we, if you can't express that and just sort of set a baseline and get an understanding of where everyone is in the room, it's a lot harder to just like move forward and start doing the work. And I really believe that any time, you know, we talk about loneliness and you can be, 
you can be lonely in a crowd, but anytime you're around other people, there's a real moment for humanization. And uh, you can really find a moment of connection. I mean, my Uber driver from the airport yesterday, we got into a deep conversation about attachment theory and, uh, and, and relationships, and we were talking about her relationship with her, with her husband and her kid. And we're, you can just, like any, like so many times we think that these, these relationships are just transactional with our colleagues or the person who's checking us out at the grocery or whatever, but this can be a, a moment. Any time you're around another human being, it can be a moment for connection. Should we do a check-in? Do you want to talk about your gratitude, your anxiety, and your hope? Yeah, because for this I think moment? it human. I think it humanizes. Let's do it because yeah, I think it humanizes it. us, and it's 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 worth it. It just shows how much it. Um, yeah. So we can do. You want to go first? You no, go you first? go first. Okay. I asked you. I asked you. <laughs> okay. Um, gratitude. Uh, I'm feeling uh, really, really grateful for my health right now. I feel very healthy. I, I was just talking to someone earlier today about how both my grandfathers died in their 40s. I'm about to turn 40 uh, next month. And I just really, I'm being 40 and having friends in their 40s, a lot of people are starting to have health problems. And I just, I wake up every morning and just make a gratitude list and share. And I, a lot, I list out like my organs individually. I'm like, thank oh. you, kidneys. Like, oh. thank you, lungs. <laughs> like, the, 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 the amount of things that have to just work in your body in order for you to just stay alive is, is just phenomenal. And so I just, I'm like feeling really grateful for my health and body at the moment because we just take that for granted, I think, too easily. Uh, anx anxiety. Uh, actually, I was, I'm feeling anxious right now because I found out um, yesterday afternoon that my, I have three half siblings and their mother just died oh. two days ago. Sorry. And, uh, and I haven't even had a chance to, to call them or reach out to them yet, so I'm just feeling anxious about that, and I, I really like, want to check in with them. And Sorry. It's okay, thank you. Uh, and I'm feeling hopeful. This is gonna sound like a plug, but um, uh, there's some really, really cool things starting to happen at, at Hinge, enabled by AI, and we're starting to reset our culture a bit and do some really cool, fast prototypes and experiments in the organization about how we think we can push dating and connection forward with the power of AI, which maybe we can talk about later. Uh, and that is just, I'm seeing some like really interesting, cool things that I think a few years ago I, I never would have imagined we could accomplish. It's amazing. Um, should and I you? go? Yeah, gratitude, go? anxiety, hope. Um, I am very grateful for these folks right here in the front row who are members of my community at The List who showed up here today to support me and to um, be a part of this conversation. Um, I really thank you very much for being there and nodding and smiling along. Thank you. You're very sweet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am also tremendously grateful for someone who's not in the room. I'm grateful for my husband. Um, I have two young kids, and um, I've been gone since Friday, and he has like tremendously handled uh, sports and uh, hamburger spaghetti and mm -hmm. all the things that come along with juggling when I'm out of town, and so I'm really grateful for his support in this moment. Um, my anxiety, my hope, my anxiety. What do I do first? I'd like to end on a positive end note. So we'll, positive. Go, so we'll okay. go anxiety. So <laughs> I, so we are gonna, we are, um, I'm about to tell you about what we're launching. We're launching something um, new today, the 10 minutes to togetherness, which I will tell you about in a second. But um, my, um, I feel like I'm standing at the precipice of something really important and really big. And so my anxiety is, equal parts anxiety and anticipation. Mm. Um, they go together, right? I have tremendous hope that this initiative that we're launching is gonna go out in the world and do its work and help people feel more connected, to give you the tools to feel more connected. And yet, it's like this unknown, right? What is that anxiety? There's, there's an underlying anxiety. Did we do enough? <laughs> Did we do enough? Do we have the right partners? Are we reaching out to all the right people? So my anxiety and anticipation come along with my hope. Yeah. I think that they, do they often go together? It sounds like they might. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, okay. Um, 
can I pivot and talk about this new thing that we're doing, this new initiative? Um, let, me, uh, let me back this up. Last year, when we were here at South By, we did a first round of research to identify the problem, the way, because we are focused on helping women rise in their work. Um, we did a round of research last year that identified this problem of loneliness, and it turns out that loneliness is preventing women from moving into positions of greater and greater power and influence because um, it's fraying their relationships around them. They are opting out of um, they're opting out of promotions and roles. This year, I mean, that was identified. We, we already talked about loneliness is a bummer. This year, we are focused on the solutions. So we did a round of research. Turns out the numbers are worse this year. 80% of people are lonely because of, underline, because of their job. 43% mm. of people say that being at work is the loneliest time of day. Now, clearly, they are not in hinge executive meetings where you're talking about your gratitude, <laughs> your anxiety, and your hope. But 43%, everybody else, is like is lonely at work. So we also, thanks to my amazing partners, um, uh, one of whom is here today, um, Natalie Lupiani of BSG and Jen De Silva of Berlin Cameron, we were able to identify the solutions. So there's a group of people at your office, at everyone's office, who are less likely to be lonely and more likely to feel connected, and we call them the cultivators. Sounds good, right? You are, either, you are either a cultivator or you need to find one. Who here thinks that you're a cultivator? You are the person who are, who are deepening their connections. Listers, I want to see you raise your hand. You really are all cultivators, right? These are the people who are, it's not, you don't have to go to networking events. You don't have to, you have to check in with the people around you. You do work that is collaborative. You have, your company also supports you by having transparency around what's being done. I mean, nothing worse than feeling isolated and siloed and unseen in your company. Um, and they just walk around the office. I mean, it sounds so crazy to say, right? But to check in with people. How are you doing? What's going on? Hey, how, how was your event the other night? How was your game? Whatever it is to have like a human connection. So we have the, we've identified these micro habits of the cultivators and the companies that support them. So. Um, but thank goodness we found some solutions. We've put them together in a new program we are launching called 10 Minutes to Togetherness. Now, 10 minutes sounds a little random, but let me explain this very quickly. There is, um, for the last 20 years, thanks to, again, my hero, Dr. Murthy, was able to identify that for the last 20 years, we have had this huge decline in the amount of time we spend together. But if we each spent 10 minutes a day intentionally building your communities, nurturing your connections, we would decrease that by half. So 10 minutes to togetherness is my anxiety and my hope yep. <laughs> for to teach everyone how to deepen the connections around you. Um, it really, uh, it's very simple, 10 minutes to togetherness.com. Please help allay my anxiety about this launch. I appreciate it. Um, I, and I think you bring up a really important point about this like loneliness epidemic and um, why I have a lot of hope around it because they're, we're dealing with, as everyone knows, huge intractable problems, environmental degradation and nuclear proliferation and all these things that feel so big and what can I really do to change it? We're all in this together. Everyone has to create this gigantic collective action for us to be able to make any real difference. There's tragedy of the commons. There's just, it's just like a very, very difficult intractable problems to be able to solve. This loneliness one is something that you can make an impact yes. for you and the people around you today or this week, and that can be very, very real and very, very felt. So you know, we're all kind of, I just had this image come to me as, as you were talking about this. It's like we're all floating around on these rafts in a freshwater lake and we're dying of thirst. And like all you have to do yes. is take 10 minutes a day to reach over this, have the habit of reaching over the side and like picking up a glass of water. Uh, but we just don't have those habits. It's not part of our culture. It's not part of what we do. We are not a relational society. We are a very individualistic, achievement-oriented society, and we don't take the time to do that. We're just rowing faster through the pond. 
and not taking a, t taking a moment to, to grab a drink of water. What do you do to stay connected? I, we heard about, your, about deepening the connections on your executive team, but you, in your personal life, how do you stay connected? Yeah, and, and by the way, the executive team is just one, one aspect of that. There's, there's a lot of little things that I do to try to remain more connected, even in, even in the office. Like for example, in most meetings I go to, I leave my devices behind and I bring a clipboard and a pen. Oh. Just so I don't get distracted. You know, how, how often are you talking to someone and someone's on their laptop and they're checking their Slack and their email and they're looking at their phone. And you can't, you're like, you're missing moments to really connect. And meetings could go so much more, so much faster, be so much more efficient if everyone just kept their consciousness like in the room on the person who's speaking one at a time and you didn't, and you gave that person the, the honor and the humanity of actually paying attention to them if they're speaking. Uh, so there's a lot of little things like I, I, I do during the day. And, and, Micro habits. And our workplace is important because it is where a lot of us spend the majority of our waking hours and a lot of our waking attention. Uh, on the personal front, I've been experimenting with different things. Uh, for a while, I was trying, um, this really takes some, some effort, but it was like some good training wheels for me, was I was, uh, I had a group of five or six friends and every single day, we had an agreement where we would send our daily high and our daily low to each other over text. I love that. And it was just a moment of, of like anti-social media, right? This is not my best self. This is not my like sheeny like picture of me. In fact, there were no pictures allowed. No you just filters. Had, you just had to you just had to text someone like what your daily high and your daily low was, which is a really interesting thing. Now I have the habit of just checking off. I have like a few little habits I do every day, and one of those five habits is. Just I just mark it off as a check-in with someone. Like once a day, a voice level check-in oh. with some other person who's not a work colleague. Uh, and that I think is a, um, just, it just, it's that, it's that, again, it's that like reaching over the side and getting a little drink of water each day. Cause we can, yeah, that's, that's all I'll say about that. The um, the check-in is so important and it's really important in my life too. I will send a text. I don't quite, I'm not quite up to voice check-in, but I have to say that there's a member of the list here who's in the audience who told me about her eight-minute phone calls. And I think that's amazing if you say to someone, listen, I'm gonna call you for eight minutes, and you know you, this is like, you're gonna do your high, you're gonna do your low, you're gonna do the most important question, how can I help you, mm -hmm. right? What can I do to support you today? And half the time, someone says, oh, there's, oh, thank you so much for even asking, right? But just the asking, but once in a while, when I do my check-in, someone will say, you know what, could you please help me unlock this something, something, something? And yes, how can I be helpful to you? I think that that's really, um, that's really important. We talk about at the list, it's so interesting you talk about highs and lows. We talk about wins. And I, I have really thought about this. Like, are we enforcing a culture of like always being on, of always having a win? Sometimes those wins are like that you dragged your butt to Friday. Right, like I think that that can sometimes be a win and to share that with a group of people who are there, who are open to you. But one of the reasons that we like to talk about wins is that I think we are very often, we don't wanna pat ourselves on the back. We don't wanna call it a win. We wanna say like, oh, this is just a step in the bigger picture, right? It's all part of that like exhaustion culture, the hustle culture that we're trying to undo. Um, but also those wins come with like hurdles and long journeys, and it's not the Instagram filtered version of the win, mm -hmm. right? This is about saying, I've been working towards this thing for a year, and if I'm being honest, I've been working on it for like 12 years, and I finally got the pieces in place to make this thing, to like pull it across the finish line, and to have your community say, I see you, I see the hard work, I'm here to support you, and what can we do to move it forward? Um, that to me is, like the next level of celebration. Yeah, I think that, so, so yeah, I originally, when I started getting into this work and trying to become a relational dolphin was a, you, you think that in order to become vulnerable, you just have to share your like deep, dark secrets and all your hard times with people and all this stuff. And, that, and that's part of it, it could be helpful to do that, but it's also nice to be able to share your, have someone to share your wins with and your celebrations with. And that's an equally important part of community and belonging. It's, it's going through all of life's ups and downs together where you're prioritizing the, again, the, the, the meat of it is the relationality. The actual thing is the 
connections and bonds you're forming with other people as you go through these highs and lows and not the highs and lows themselves. Highs and lows alone are just not that much fun. One of the things that I appreciate so much for you is when you talk about that you've been doing texting, right, and that you have this community. And one of the things that came out of our research is that the connectors, right, these beautiful cultivators, that they have diverse communities. And I mean people who they've worked with before, people that report to them, people that, um, people that they report to, that they, that they keep these connections for a long time through their lives. Is that true of your networks too? Uh, yeah, I think I've changed, like my story, I, I'm a person who I think like is a little bit more, I'm, I'm not as like an intentional networker who's like bringing people along. I think I'm a bit more of a, whoever I'm happen to be around right now, I wanna like go deep with, whether it's the person I'm driving in an Uber with or whatever, but there are some people who are that type of connector who like maintain those relationships, they have the spreadsheets and they're like, this is, these are my college friends, and these are my high school friends, and these are my work friends, and I'm gonna check in and I have all their birthdays noted, and um, I have a friend who will send me like a happy anniversary note before my wife will. Um, oh, Because nice. she just like is so meticulous all right. I like about that. all of her, you know, she knows like, she has like five different dates for me. Uh, yeah, she's, yeah, anyway, it's a long story. But there, there are people like that in the world and, and that's another way to, to form it. And I'm more of just like, uh, oh, who's around me right now? Great, let's like. One of the things study. that we talked about before was the ways in which this, has really actually separated us. Um, and the ways in which we spend all of our time scrolling through Instagram, scrolling through, I don't know what, whatever we're scrolling through, um, has really kept us distracted. And I have personally really worked hard for the last six months to put this, like the need to, sh to filter and look and sh I find it, I find it really distracting. Do you wanna talk a little bit more about some of the ways in which uh, that's really driving us apart. That's yeah, not near and helping dear to my our heart. connection. We think we're connecting, but we're not really. I have so much to say about this. And ironic, right, for someone who like built a, an app that people spend time on. But, uh, but I think our, our, our tagline, designed to be deleted, gets down to the core of what I think an app should be doing for us. Um, so my uh, if, so when we think about loneliness, loneliness is not a new problem that just popped up over the last 20 years. I mean, I think culturally we've been a very achievement-oriented individualistic society for I, time immemorial, frankly. Um, but what has happened over the last 20 years or so is a dramatic, oh, I'll say one more thing about that. There was a, there was a book that came out by this guy Robert Putnam in 2000 called Bowling Alone, which seems very quaint at the time because it was, but it was like, he was already raising the warning sign about how we're deteriorating as a culture because we have individualized leisure time and we spend all our time watching television and being on the internet. And that was in 2000. Now fast forward yeah, 20, years, 20 years and you've seen a dream, that, that he, he was starting there. He was looking 1950 to 2000. You look 2000 to 2024 and we've almost, almost completely displaced time spent in real life together with time spent staring at screens. Uh, it's, it's a thousand fewer hours among young people that they, they don't spend together in real life, in person anymore. 70% of the time, we're down to 30% of what we had just 20 years ago in terms of in real life connection. And as, and as we were sort of talking about before, the even when you are together in real life, the connections are shallower because there, there was a study out of Virginia Tech about um, what happens when there's a phone on the table and you're having a conversation. Just a, a face down on the table phone dramatically uh, decreases the um, emotional vulnerability, the complexity of the conversation because people are always just kind of aware that at any moment someone could pick up their phone and kind of exit the conversation. Like an escape hatch. Yeah. yeah. And so it's an unsafe environment to really share yourself or to have a real connection. And so we're, we have 70% less time we're spending together in real life. The 30% that we have left is less, is less quality. And it's because of these 
devices, and I don't want to say that it's because of the devices alone. I think that the devices are uh, an amazing technology. I love to use FaceTime. I love to use Uber. There's all kinds of services that I think uh, are amazing and miraculous and, and take a lot of time out of my day. So that's, yeah. that's great. Um, sorry, make me much more efficient. However, there's also a whole suite of services that were originally meant to connect us. They were called social networks back in the day, and they were because they were supposed to connect us and make us feel a greater sense of belonging and, and connection. And they probably did for the first few years. And then somewhere along the way, we kind of stopped talking about social networks and we started talking about social media because the business model of these companies was ad-based, and so more impressions is better, and it turns out that outrageous news and celebrities and gossip and influencers are just a bit more interesting than your friends, and we started getting the, the Or they kind of, know how to be more interesting. They know how to, friends, yeah, yeah. Because right? Like, your they, friends are great, your friends are amazing, yes. but they know how to... Will work the algorithm. Work the algorithm. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And the, and... Right, and it became work. Hmm? It became work. It's a job, right? It's not if just. If you want to become, if yes. you want to be one of those like influencer people. If you even want to see yes. <laughs> anything, if you want to see anything but that, yes. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but yes, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm infuriated for you. Yeah. With and you. it's, and it's as someone who, so I, I, I personally, I've never really used social media. I started to use it in the, I don't know. I tried, I tried to like use it again in like 2012, 2013, and. Uh, I have a history with drug and alcohol addiction. I know what addiction feels like. I know what it feels like to constantly have that pull and that tug and to have yourself distracted. And I started using those, those services and I was like, I, I didn't get sober just to do this. Like this is like, this feels exactly like addiction. Replace like this is the exact same thing. My brain is always half somewhere else. I feel like I've always got to do this thing. And, I, and when you think about what an addiction is, it's a, it's a destructive, habit. It, it's something that you do, it's a, a habit in, in that it has a trigger and a response and a reward. And, um, and we have lots of habits and habits can be positive, but a, a habit that would be negative is something that doesn't make your life better. And I think we have to think like, is all that time spent on Instagram versus the other things that I could have done with my life, am I better off for it or am I worse off for it? How do I feel you know, 20 minutes after I put down the phone, do I feel more connected and more sense of belonging and just more motivated and excited by life or do I feel drained? And for me at least, uh, I felt drained. And in these devices, I, th I think about them kind of like, well, uh, sorry, I can go on forever. No, I, I, was, well, I was about in. to say that it's not, you're absolutely right, it's not the device, right? It's, this is, we wanna check our, our health and wellness, we wanna track our sleep, there's lots of things that can be really beneficial, but the, um, I noticed it in my own life when my daughter was saying to me, you're always on Instagram. And I was like, I am not, it's work. And then I was like, but is it really? <laughs> and by the way, who am I working for, right? Am I working for Instagram? So I, I, um, I do think, however, that technology can be part of the solution here. Is that right? I mean, talk to me about what you're thinking about when it comes to, you're someone who thinks a lot about how we use technology. Like, how can we use technology to help solve the loneliness epidemic and to create or facilitate or support real connection? Great question. So, uh, again, I, after all that said, I run an app. <laughs> it's called Hinge. Uh, it's a dating app. And but, you know, it's an interesting story in the creation of Hinge. So I, I started Hinge in 2011, and about four years in, uh, I real, four to five years in, I realized, wow, this is just not what I had set out to build. There were articles that came out called, like, the dawn of the dating apocalypse in Vanity Fair, where Hinge was heavily featured. And the point was we had made this gamified, superficial thing that had ruined romance and, and dating. And it was hard for me, frankly, to, to deny that. I think that, that uh, I had to take like a good hard look at what we had built because we were so focused on the competition. We were so driven by metrics like engagement and retention and all these other metrics that a lot of these other social media companies are uh, paying attention to. And that's what, that's what people are paying attention to for us because they, VCs equated us to 
social media companies. And so like, how much time are people spending an app? What's your daily over monthly? Like, what are the, all these metrics? And so, and we built something that fulfilled all those metrics, but it wasn't helping people feel, actually get out on dates, uh, have great dates, feel more belonging, connection, feel more human. And so we tore down the business. I let go of half the company and we rebuilt from scratch to try to build the relationship app. And uh, the point was we would really slow people down. We'd be about quality over quantity. And most importantly, we reset our North Star metric as uh, great dates. Like how many dates are we sending people uh, out on? We're still the only app that even asks if you went on a date and if it was good. And that ultimately, when we decide to release a feature, we're not looking at did it drive more time in app, did it drive more matches, did it drive whatever. It's just we're looking at does it create more dates per user? Great dates per user. Great I love that. I think it's great. And point being that you, there's, there is a different way to approach uh, the to approach the market, and I think to build a differentiated product, especially right now, um, I, I think that there's gonna be a whole new category of apps. I hope that there are uh, an industry called social wellness. Like we know about personal wellness, we know about uh, you know, uh, eating right and meditating and doing all these things, but as we said, connection and belonging are one of our most fundamental human needs, and there's not really yet a, what I would really call like a social wellness platform. Um, Hinge is trying to approach dating in a way that helps make, helps increase social wellness, um, but it'll be interesting to see what else emerges. If you were to create a social network that was maximizing for feelings of belonging and connect, connection and depth and not time spent in app, because I think it would be a very, very different platform. Part of what we are here to do today is to activate this amazing group of people. And when you talk about rebuilding Hinge around a new North Star, around, I love this, right? The idea of belonging, of togetherness, of, of great dates, right? That's a great human connection idea. What, when you think about these humans here, what can they do to shift their thinking? to shift their work, to shift their North Star? Uh, so one, I think it starts with your, with your personal North Star, some of the things that we talked about before, because I think you have to really feel it and understand it to even know what we're, what we're talking about here. And uh, I spent most of my life, I didn't discover this young, I discovered this very recently, that, that my true barometer for what makes me happy is feelings of belonging and connection. And I had to learn a lot of new habits that felt awkward. It feels awkward to just like call a friend. And be like, hey, how's it? Yeah. How's it? Like, people don't even do that anymore. It's almost offensive to like call someone without a warning. But aren't uh, they so grateful? <laughs> like, I mean, at first it's a surprise, but then they're like, oh yeah. yeah. Like, wait, you just called so to like talk to me and tell me like that you're really grateful for our friendship for this reason? Like, that's, you know, it's it's a, it can be life changing. Yeah. So one, I think we have to do it personally, and we have this opportunity to build it within our organizations, and it takes. It takes a real standing up. It was kind of a weird thing to ask my executive team to do a few years ago, to be like, okay, everyone, we're gonna take 20 minutes and everyone's gonna share this. You know, we, have, we have new members come into the executive team sometimes and they're like, okay, welcome to, the, welcome to our little cult here because we're gonna do yeah. some like weird personal rituals uh, that are gonna make us all feel more belonging connected, but trust me, it's worth it the time. That's a cult, that's a cult I'd like to be a part of. That yeah, sounds like a nice, right. sounds nice. Um, and so, so part of it is just like build it for yourself and the people around you. It, it really makes a difference. It will make a big difference in your lives. It'll make a big difference. And I've seen it ripple effect through my executive team and to their teams that it can really be a life changer uh, to be able to have those kinds of relationships in the office, to open people up to that possibility and, um, and then see them go open it up for other people. So that's all great. And then if you work in a space that is social or tech or whatever, I think we have to think deeply about building what I, what I would call like a sustainable business model. And a sustainable business model means that you are not just thinking about your near-term business metrics as your drivers. You have to think about what are the like deeper, more sustainable metrics that we're achieving that are actually in service of our customers. Are we, are we measuring whether we're making our customers' lives better off and are we measuring that directly? And if you're not doing that well over time, you might have a little blip of success, 
but over time, you're, I don't think that um, it's actually going to be sustainable. So, and there's, I think, ripe opportunity out there in the world right now to be building new services, and AI is gonna create a whole new wave of disruption. And it's really interesting because I think we're at a point of a real precipice with AI because I think AI can very much stand behind us and help us to become better connected and coach us at how to be more relational and how to <clears throat> build better relationships, which yeah. is how I'm thinking about it at Hinge. Or it can stand between us. Yeah. It can be the thing that we interact with instead of instead, instead of. of other humans. And I think that's a pretty scary way to look at it. And I think some people view that you can build an AI companion and that's just as good as another human. And I think we're missing something very fundamental if we believe that to be true. One of the things, I love how you are thinking about your responsibility in your life, your responsibility to your team, your responsibility to your customer, and your responsibility in the world. And I think that that, even to recognize that everyone here has a role to play in helping to solve the loneliness epidemic, to create greater connection, um, I think that that is one of the most important pieces that I want everybody to take away, is that you, that this is, within your control, that this is something that you can have an impact on. Um, I was thinking through, do I, how do I measure up to this test, you said. My North Star is to help women step into their power, in their personal lives, in their professional lives, um, and into their personal power. I do actually want women to step into greater positions of power in the world, but first, I want everyone to step into their own personal power and their own personal responsibility. And then I think about how am I taking my personal mission, my North Star, and supporting my community, right? The women, um, non-binary and underrepresented leaders of the list. This, we are a small community. And then this new piece that we are launching is, is how do I take the magic, we call it the magic of the list, right? How do we take this magic where 500 human beings are devoted to helping each other achieve and succeed with gentleness, with generosity. And then how do we take that and magnify that out into the world? Because not everybody can join the list, but everybody can create this community around them. So that's the, I feel like I'm doing okay on the test. I didn't know that you were gonna walk us through, but as you were talking, as you were talking, I was like, what is my North Star? How am I putting it in place around me? And how am I putting it in place in the world? Um, I think that that is, um, you know, look, this is, a, this is a powerful group of people. And South by Southwest is a powerful platform to spread that message. But I think that that, you know, we called this panel um, not the Ann and Justin show, although I think that's a great pitch. Um, but we called this panel Culturally Confronting Loneliness because we have a responsibility in our lives, in our companies that we run and, and operate, and, and at a larger level to create companies that are creating human connection. Um, I love the way that you threaded uh, the conversation um, from digital addiction and AI, but thinking about it with great responsibility and thoughtfulness in fostering human connection. Um, I also really love how you are thinking about real life connection, because I don't see my community. We see each other on email, and then we get together, and we, like, we've been, never seen each other, and then we hug, and it's fantastic, right? These people who I've only ever seen digitally. But talk a little bit about what you are doing with One More Hour. Great. Uh, so we and and so we have a social impact platform at Hinge called One More Hour, um, but I do want also want to make sure that it really comes across. But the, the thing that I feel like I always have to say before I talk about social impact programs is that you have to make sure that the core product you're offering in the world is doing good, right? It's not enough to be like polluting the world and then taking five percent of your profits and yes. then giving it to like a green cause. Like that doesn't. That doesn't really, I, I would so much rather you took that 5% and plowed it back in your business to think about how you could build a more sustainable core business. So first, like, get the core business right, because it's nothing that frustrates me more than seeing social impact programs that are, like, antithetical 
to, or it's like we're just going to do, we're going to clean up 5% of the damage we created with our core platform. Uh, so, but at, uh, at, at Hinge, we came to a, a very similar insight as you at the list with your 10 minutes to connection, and we call it one more hour because, again, we, we see that 1,000 fewer hours among Gen Z, which is our core audience, yes. uh, per year. And so we just think about how can you, um, especially in a phone-free environment, uh, spend just one more hour per week. Just like one more hour per week would actually be quite meaningful in the people's lives. And uh, that's coming, it's gonna be a platform, there's gonna be a whole series of things uh, rolling out. We've, we've uh, announced a million dollar fund to fund groups that are getting people together in real life. We've just... Um, Can we cheer for a million bucks to support people <laughs> in real life? Thank you for that. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I think if you go to our... Uh, we, we just released something that I, I think is like very fun and cool, but it's, a lot, it's just a lot of activations. But this one's a little... It's called a phone book, and it comes in a, what looks like an Apple case with a phone, and you take it out, and then the, it looks like a... A, l a little phone, and you, but it's actually a book, and it's a book full of things to go do uh, instead of look at your phone. Oh. And uh, yeah, I think you can get a, you can order hard copies of it, or you can at least look on the website and 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 just flip through it digitally to see um, what's in there. But there's just going to be a whole lot of activations, really trying to raise awareness about uh, how we get people again spending less time on screens and more time. Uh, out in the real world interacting, which again is very core to Hinge's mission of we want people spending less time on the app searching for a date and more time actually out on great dates. Great dates. Yeah. Um, while we have these people here, one of the things that is um, a trademark of the Ann Show Cat Show, <laughs> and so I want you to give everybody in this room marching orders. What is the one thing that you want them to do when they leave this room? Uh, for me, it's it's that like, what is that one habit, that one connection habit that you are going to build to start uh, getting that sort of like daily drink of connection? And it can be personal. It can be in the workplace. Um, I think actually the workplace is, a, is an easy place to start because yes. it, it is a place full of uh, people and rituals, right? You, you have meetings that you would normally have. And if you just start whatever, whatever your kind of weekly stand-up or weekly team meeting is, building in some form of relationality into that meeting where you can actually view each other as human beings and connect can do a lot for you and for your... Um, and for your colleagues. And so I think that that is, uh, that's my like personal recommendation. Yeah. And then my professional, if you are in the world of, of tech or social tech, is go back and look at what metrics are you focused on as a business. When you get together in your, you know, when leaders at your organization talk about what metrics they're moving or what their big objectives are for the year, pay attention to what those are. Is it we're just trying to drive revenue from here to here? Is it we're trying to drive time and app from here to here? Or is it, does it actually reflect what you're trying to deliver for your customers? And I think it's, it's just so critical for us, similar to the, like, it's analogous to focusing on the relationality before the success. I mean, it, it's to focus on what are we really here as a business to accomplish? Um, is, is the ultimate goal of our business just to make as much money as possible as quickly as possible? Or did we come together as human beings in an organization to accomplish something that we are using the tool of a business and capitalism in order to accomplish? And uh, I'm not sure society has a lot more tolerance for companies that are just focused on making as much money as soon as possible. All right, those are your marching orders. I have two things I want everybody to do. First of all, go to 10 minutes to togetherness.com, download the research report and the tools. When you think about your, the rituals that you can bring into your own life, that is in our toolkit. Um, I have a little reminder band. Um, these are, this is part of a partnership we did with Little Words Project, Togetherness. So these are a reminder to spend your 10 minutes of togetherness 
um, Tara, I'm going to give you, I, I see you're not wearing the Thank one you. I gave you before, but I'm giving you another. <laughs> right here. I took it off, we may as well. But that's actually part of it, is to give them away, right? Is like, when you need your moment of togetherness, you also give it away. Um, so 10 minutes to togetherness, help us launch this program, help us let everybody build the connection around them. Now, my other thing, I, I don't know what you said, you said your phone on, on, your, on the um, desk is distracting, but what if it's under your butt? <laughs> In any case. Under the chair. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, take out your phone, set up a text, and check in on someone who's in your community. Let them know that you are thinking of them. I, here, there's a really simple script. Hey, you've been on my mind. How did mm, go? Can I help you? And that's it. I want to see phones. I mean, I know, we're talking, we talked about phones, but I want to see, who's got phones out? Our, uh, thank you. <laughs> and, and an alternative script is, is sending um, a gratitude or just something that you're grateful about someone or grateful for their connection. Like that's always, it doesn't even require a response. It can just be, hey, I was reflecting and I'm just so grateful for X, Y, or Z or this is what you did for me or whatever. Um, it's just a nice, it's a nice way to stay connected and yeah. it doesn't even need a response. The check-in, I yeah. love it so much. I'm gonna check in on you. I'm gonna check in on you later today even though I think we're gonna see each other <laughs> again. <laughs> Um, I want to say thank you to everyone in this room and express my gratitude for you being here, for bringing us so much good energy here, nodding. Um, we couldn't do it without you. Um, literally, we couldn't do it without you. So I thank you so much. I thank South by Southwest. I thank you, Justin, for being here with Thanks for so much me. openness and generosity. Um, I thank you. So thank you great all. Work. Thank you.